New Coordinator Tour arrived in Appalachia, and alongside three new public events, a new endgame boss, and a host of new characters, the fairgrounds are home to some interesting new lore that could be discovered. In today's video, I'll be going through 10 different things you may have missed, including the true origins of one NPC, exploring the difficult relationship between three of the park's residents, and some hints that we may not have actually seen the last of the Ultralight Titan just yet. Let's get started. First up today, we're talking about the biggest creature in Fallout 76, the Ultrasight Titan. Although this battle could be initiated at any time, Pete Myers can provide us with a first description of the creature. You've seen it though, right? Or heard it? I mean, it was huge! And with... giant claws! Instructed to investigate abandoned mineshaft 2 for clues, we arrive and immediately the ground will shake. Surrounding the area, large Ultrasight crystal shards jut out of the ground, and exploring more closely, a number of clues can be discovered. Bodies litter the ground, investigating a Brahmin corpse look hints at the creature's size, and a scrawled note reveals that nothing worked, hitting its arm slowed it down, but it just came back stronger. But our quest objective can be found on the body of former Blood Eagle Jack Woodhouse. A holotape recording details his last encounter with the creature, I gotta get out of here! I gotta... And upstairs we can find a diary as well that also appears to belong to him. Of particular interest, one entry details how bullets did nothing to the crystals, and instead using a pickaxe was better suited. This is actually a hint referencing how using a melee weapon is a necessity in the boss fight. After nuking abandoned Mineshaft 2, the Titan emerges alongside a host of Ultramites, a new Molrat variant, and Mole Miners to battle us in a brutal fight to the death. But perhaps most interestingly, the large crystals would form with each phase of the battle. These are inherently tied to the Titan itself, needing to be destroyed to damage it. Having a look under the map at any time, you can actually find these crystals waiting prior to the boss fight actually beginning. But in a general sense, they seem to signify where the Titan is located, or where it may have travelled through. Exploring the Tunnel of Love, we find the greatest concentration of these crystals. Reading through some entries by Alfonso on a terminal located at the entrance, he mentions awful noises and tales of some monster moving through the tunnels, which actually lines up pretty well with what Jack Woodhouse's final words were. Defeating the Titan within each allotted time limit brings an end to the creature, and as it crashes to the floor, we can inspect the body, quite literally walking inside, which is an interesting feature. However, the large Ultrasight Crystal Shards can also be found at another location since this update. Travelling to Welch, at the back of the Mole Miner infested town, is where we can find some more. And they aren't alone either, as the Ultramites from the boss fight can also be found here too. So, taking stock for a moment, I want to ponder a couple of questions. Why can the crystals also be found in Welch in particular? And why are the oversized crystals appearing now at all? And I think an answer can potentially be found in the original lore of the mineral itself. Atomic mining services use atomic detonations to mine deeper than ever before, and at this depth is where they discovered Ultrasight, and the corporation quickly realised its potential. Terminals found at the glass cavern note how AMS fully believed it to be the future fuel source for the entire United States, and with them in control of the supply, their hegemony on the market. Entering into partnerships with Hornwright Industrial, the Garahan Mining Corporation, and Poseidon Energy, Ultrasight would be used to power Watoga, and it would be used as fuel in the Poseidon Energy Plant. Taking the minerals used nationwide, however, was not immediately an option, as reading through the Ultrasight R&D report on CEO Kilson's terminal in the AMS corporate headquarters, we learned that contact between pure Ultrasight and depleted Ultrasight caused both materials to suffer a corrosive reaction. This is the same reaction that is actually caused by Ultrasight weaponry being used against Scorched which exhibit pure ultracite crystals. Continuing through the report though, Welch takes centre stage. The admission that Mineshaft 9 was previously marked a failure after the initial atomic detonation. But, ultracite suddenly developed at a rapid pace, leading to veins bursting into the town itself. Charleston Herald provides a second account of AMS's actions after this. Entitled Corporate Bully, this edition describes the corporation's return to the town claiming the land itself and its unfortunate residents were former homes. Hostility bored over leading to protests, cover-ups, evictions, and the arrival of infamous security personnel. The CEO's terminal confirms that AMS did not understand the creation process of Ultrasight itself. In the present day, this conflict is long dead. AMS are gone. The miners remain, changed and more hostile than ever before. We find the ores in the town still, but as of this update, it would seem that Ultrasight has actually entered its next stage of evolution. 
the commonality with its initial discovery by AMS, atomic radiation. The mine shafts which rapidly filled with ultrasite had first been subject to atomic detonations pre-war. And post-war, radiation is unsurprisingly abundant. The crystals we find at Welch now are also of course home to the ultramites, meaning both aren't actually specific to the boss fight, and in my opinion hint that the ultrasite titan may have a future as an area boss similar to the Wendigo Colossus, which can sometimes spawn in nuke zones. Eager to test this, we did nuke Welch to see if anything happened, but sadly, nothing did. It was a stretch, as nothing was mentioned prior to this update, but who knows? The prospect of Ultrasite developing further, potentially leading to more Titans, is an interesting concept. However, circling back to the Tunnel of Love, there are more discoveries to be made inside the mine. Starting back at Alfonso's terminal, the series of messages addressed to Abigail begin with an explanation. Alfonso and a team of miners were sent into the long abandoned mine shaft, looking for fancy looking crystals. Another reference to the Ultrasite crystals, and another indication of how sought after these were. He also mentions finding baseball memorabilia in a storage room, which we can actually find scattered around the terminal. But in the November entry, we find a first mention of awful noises and ghosts. By the final entry, the sound of things scratching at the wall, burrowing, and the feeling of being watched at all times was becoming too much for Alfonso. So leaving this terminal behind, it was time to head further into the mine shaft. Passing this camera, look out for this nice little detail of these photos, that taking a closer look are actually filled with what looks like player characters. There are some classic outfit combinations on show in these pictures, and it was actually confirmed to be a cut feature in a recent livestream by Bethesda, as originally the cameras would have flashed each time players walked by. Heading further down the tunnels into the main room, a deathclaw nest can be found tucked away in a corner, littered with bones, cracked eggs, and freshly mined ultracite crystals, in close proximity to barrels of ultracite which share similarities to standard radioactive barrels found elsewhere. Heading up the scaffolding at the back, we arrive at an automated refinery. Crystals lay on the conveyor belt, and circling around the side, we see that these barrels were being filled with processed crystals, which, considering our findings earlier on, may have made this ultrasite refined and potentially depleted, making the barrel's proximity to the pure crystals a potential hazard. Behind this, though, we can find a note entitled Ghosts, which lies on the table here. Echoing the thoughts of Alfonso, the note's author describes the chilling sensation of sounds heard within the mine, pickaxes striking against stone, and a theory that these are in fact ghosts of the victims of the 1907 Monongo mining disaster, which is a real world event and is considered to be the worst mining disaster in American history, when 362 miners were killed. What's particularly interesting about this note though, is an identical one can also be found in some Monongo mine. Also entitled Ghosts, it can be found just before the boss fight on a push card and is word for word exactly the same. I'm not sure if this is an oversight or it has some significance, but its placement in the Monongo mine where the 1907 disaster actually took place seemingly made more sense. Heading outside though, it's time to talk with the fairgrounds residents. Immediately to our left, we find a ghoul vendor called Betty. Asking who she is, she has a lot to say. I'm Betty. I run this little shop. My papa used to call me Missy since all I brought was misfortune. Maybe he was right, but I prefer Betty. Or maybe Sunny, seeing as I don't bring nothing but sunshine now. It turns out that Betty isn't actually her real name, but a preferred one. It's hard to miss the detail about her other nickname, Missy, and we can ask her to explain further. Death. Or at least, that's what papa said. Mama didn't make it when she had me. It weren't my fault. Another speech option and the decision behind naming herself Betty becomes clearer. Oh, not long at all. I'm actually a local. As local as you can get, really. I was born over at the Belching Betty. As it's revealed, she was actually born at the Belching Betty mine, making her the only local member of the Nukawad on tour. Betty's a friendly face. Here's a smile just for you. Bye now. It's in stark contrast to another vendor who is also close by. Opposite Betty, we meet Del Walsh. Dell doesn't seem to have much time for us, or apparently anyone else at the fairgrounds. Another day of my genius wasted. Muttering to himself and short-tempered, he has little interest in engaging us in conversation. I'm Dell, medic, busy, so let's keep this short. But when pressed, he does reveal that in fact he once worked at the main nuke world. Well, not that it's really any of your business, but I worked at the nuke world theme park prior to the war. It's actually a neat little tie-in, as Dell actually appeared first in a holotape in Fallout 4. This is Dell Walsh. 
I'm a paramedic in Nuka World's Infirmary Center, and this report is dated July 14th, 2077. The other big takeaway from being in proximity to Dell is his apparent dislike for Pat, the exuberant organizer of the tour. I hope Pat leaves me alone today. Going as far to warn us about staying away from her, and pressing him for more details, he explains why. But definitely stay away from Pat. Every day, she complains about my chems. The relationship between Pat, Dell, and Pete is a complicated one. Pete is a chem addict, and the main point of contention is around the continued supply of chems that Dell claims he needs and Pat strongly believes he does not. Even Gunter has his thoughts on this too, and we can learn the most about all of these characters for a series of diaries and notes that are located at the employee's campsite, which can actually be found atop this hill. Getting to the bottom of who is correct or not will require looking for some evidence. Starting with Dell's trailer, we find a creepy doll in a briefcase, but on the dresser we find his journal. Beginning with his time at Nuka World, it progresses through the news of his new job and the hope his parents are impressed, which we discover not long after that they weren't, and it goes through to the aftermath of the war and the deaths of Randall and Muriel, who are actually the parents of Pat and Pete, who previously ran the tour before them. A big time jump later, and we have a detailed account of Dell's position. He claims Pete cannot cope without prescriptions, and Pat simply doesn't understand that he's keeping him alive. As a doctor, he knows what's best. But our investigation won't stop here. We still need to hear from the other two, and Dell's notes actually don't give us an indication of what exactly he's been prescribing to Pete. So heading down the hill, there are two more trailers belonging to Betty and Gunter. The first one belonging to Betty is actually empty, but outside of Gunter's we find a note written by Pat addressed to Dell. Clearly she's very angry and doesn't think much of the prescription. Inside Gunter's trailer, we find his diary up on the side here. We'll be returning to look at this in more detail, but skipping forwards, we find in the 2092 entry that Dell was first asked by the group to keep an eye on Pete. By 2098, the situation has become more critical, with Pete being found in a ditch as he'd nearly overdosed. Though Gunter actually does note that the actual work Pete has been doing around the park has drastically improved, with the attractions and robots in great shape. Heading back up, it's time to look in Pat's trailer. Leaving the management terminal for the moment, her diary is found at the back of the room on a bedside table. What's interesting is a similar incident is discussed in an entry dated 2094. Pete was found in a ditch, pumped up on Daddio. Again. This is actually the first mention of one of the chems that Pete has been using. But our final stop will confirm what more of these are. Heading into Pete's trailer, immediately we can spot two notes. And some discarded chems under the bed. And the drug in question? The miniature grade amphetamine, Psycho. Now for a little reading as we brave some of Pete's poetry. We learn that Pete believes Dell's prescription is actually helping him to write his poetry. And in his first poem, Daddio is mentioned again. At the end of the second poem, the line, The Fury Keeps Me Going, might be a reference to the much stronger version of Psycho called Fury, or just Psycho itself. The final poem ends with no direct mention, but Pete's final diary entry does mention he sees something crazy big behind the camp. We know, of course, that actually he wasn't making something up, as he did actually see the Octocyte Titan. But taking stock then, let's see what we know from the evidence. Of the two chems, Dadir seems to make more sense. Described as being popular with beatniks and intellectuals before the Great War, it raises intelligence and perception at a cost of charisma. But Psycho? The Psycho addiction message from the original Fallout sums it up best, I think. As it said, if you do not take Psycho on a regular schedule, you will suffer. If you do, others will suffer. This chem is a popular one with some of the more violent raider gangs in the region and has been called names like Angry Juice and the Big Red One in Fallout New Vegas. Essentially on the surface it seems like a strange choice for Pete, who is described as being a little bit depressed, and it definitely seems like a bad chem for him to become addicted to. So in considering all of this I'm inclined to agree with Pat looking at the evidence. Moving on, the second note in Pete's trailer is actually from Betty. She's asking if you'd like to show her around the Tunnel of Love for what sounds a lot like a date. Gunter's diary also references Betty taking a liking to Pete, and we can of course ask the man himself. After complimenting my face for the upteenth time, I like your face. You can ask Pete what he thinks about Betty. She seems nice enough. It keeps inviting me into the tunnel of love. Don't quite understand why she can't just go alone. I got things to fix. Turns out this isn't the first time she's tried. After pointing out the seemingly obvious, <laughs> I doubt that. She's cute, but even if that were true, I don't know that I'm that way inclined, if you know what I mean. We have some more options on what to ask next. What? No, I didn't mean it like that at all. I'm still just 
trying to figure things out for myself, you know? I don't know, maybe not, or maybe I am. This wasteland is complicated enough. Trying to understand myself too? Oof. But hey, good talk, right? Part of me wishes I didn't feel that way, but it wouldn't be fair to make her think otherwise. Seems fair enough, so without wanting to pry any further, we leave Pete to his privacy and head to Most Wanted to talk to the authentic gullified cowboy, Gunter. Well, hello there, partner. Except for our friend here, it turns out, isn't from the Wild West at all. Talking with Gunter, he can provide you some information about Most Wanted. A few different ways, but the easiest is by sticking up one of these towns, folk. And you can ask him why the Wild West even has a place of Nuka World, and he does explain it by saying, Well, it's a play on words. You know, dryness, thirst, needing that sweet, sweet Nuka Cola like an oasis in the desert. Spend time in Dry Rock Gulch, and you'll be thirsting for a gulp of Nuka Cola. Talking to him, he's a very committed actor, and he will be in character even off the clock. But to discover more about his origins, we need to head back to the campsite. Make sure to read the notes around the complaints bin as there are some humorous and accurate reviews about the game show Most Wanted. But heading back to Gunter's trailer and taking a look at his diary, it opens with an entry from 2055. At a time, Gunter lived at an orphanage and was involved in an incident that led to him leaving. A lady named Tabitha was mistreated and he did something to another guy at the orphanage. What exactly this was we don't learn, but it was bad enough for him to go out on his own. It's actually worth noting as well that Tabitha is also the name that he gives to the animatronic horse in the Most Wanted event. A year later, he was hired by Nuka World, and we learned that it was his cowboy impressions that helped him get the job, which is something he'd learned watching old westerns with his father. On the final page, it's revealed that he was a resident of Boston, and the orphanage was located there. I did do a quick check to see if any cropped up in Fallout 4, but all I could find was one on the Far Harbor Island, so I'm not sure if that would be the same orphanage or if it's just someone we never actually got to see. But after a time jump, the 2077 entry confirms that Gunter never did get to see Texas in the end. Sheltering with the kids, Pete and Pat and some sewers, he eventually left to find their parents, which actually led to him turning into a ghoul. The final discovery from the fairgrounds for today can be found on the manager's terminal in Pat's trailer. There's a lot to read on the terminal, including Pat's personal log, which mentions raiders attacking, the yearly earnings and losses Nuka World on tour makes, but perhaps most interestingly, the staff jobs list. There's a lot of names on here, and it gives an indication of how many people have been lost during the tour. Looking around the fairgrounds itself, it does seem pretty barren. There are empty stalls, unmanned shops, and damaged rides. It's fair to say that New Quarter Tour isn't in the best shape currently. But what I found particularly interesting is there's a further five members of the park we haven't met yet. Harold Reeves and Rebecca Mabry on a supply run, Omar Green, Ox, and Jackie are out hunting, and I haven't had an extensive look yet, but I wonder if these might be random encounters that could be added. Let me know in the comments if you run into any of these characters in future. I hope you enjoyed these 10 lore discoveries. I've enjoyed the new events, and I've really enjoyed these new lore additions, particularly around Ultrasight. Eager to get people's thoughts on this in particular, and anything else covered in the video. The new ally, Leo Petrov, also has some very interesting lore connections, both to other Fallout games and 76, so look out for a lore video on him very soon. If you enjoyed this particular video, then why not drop a like on it as well. With that said, I'm off. Thank you for watching, and we will see you in the next one.